Um, so we, oh, welcome to this month's developers forum. Um, so this month um, we have Konstantin Alman Elzer, uh, who's in Wolfgang Huber's lab in Heidelberg. Um, he's been doing a lot of package development. Um, he's a very good programmer. He's been organizing code reviews within our lab, which has been a really, um, a really great innovation, actually. It's making all of us think about our code, teach other people how to do code. It's been, it's been really good, and Constantine's really uh, been the driving force behind all of that. Um, but one package he's been working on uh, is a kind of, I guess he's going to introduce it himself, but a, a mirror to the kind of matrix stats, but for the sparse matrix representations. Um, so it has the imaginative name sparse matrix stats, um, and he's basically going to hopefully introduce us to this, show us some of the, the cool features and the performance enhancements that it brings. So um, go for it, Constantin. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. I have to figure out how this works with. Ooh, I've never used. Okay, I guess you can see Slack now. Is that correct? And now you can see my PowerPoint, I hope. Yeah, can right. somebody give me a thumbs up if it's working? Great, perfect. Okay, yes. Um, well, as Mike already said, um, also, we said what I've put on the slide about myself. So I've been programming in R now for by, about five to six years. And I guess the most important fact for this pre, uh, package I'm going to present today is that I, about a year ago, started my PhD. And if you start a PhD at EMBL Heidelberg, you have three months of lectures in the beginning, which were not always so interesting. So I did take the time sitting in the back row and got some programming done there. And um, what inspired me to this package was that I saw that a lot of people, especially working in the single cell field, were writing very similar functions to calculate, for example, the variance of a sparse matrix. And we all know that it's inefficient if everybody does it themselves. So what I wanted to do is to have one reference implementation which works well, which is stable, which is well tested, that everybody can simply import to the package and they don't need to reinvent the wheel all over again. So my goal was to take the very popular matrix stats pa package and port the API to sparse DGC matrices. So I guess most of you will be familiar with matrix stats, but just as a simple summary, what this package is about, it provides lots of different summary functions that can be applied to the rows and the columns of matrices and Henrik, the maintainer of the matrix stat package, has made sure that it's as efficient as it can be. So it's a very popular package, as I already mentioned. So it nearly has 400 or more than 400,000 downloads every month, which probably also comes from the huge number of dependencies the package has. So a lot of other R, uh, CRAN and bioconductor packages import or reverse depend on matrix stats because it provides so much useful functionality and is so efficient. The matrix stats API is actually quite long, and I guess most of the people only use the call sum or the uh, call vars function, but it provides a lot more functions than that. And this is perfectly if you sit every day for three months in a lecture hall and you can step by step go through the functions and implement them and learn a lot about all the different functionalities matrix stats provides. So as a simple example, the, I guess, most popular function is the call sums function. It works as just as, as, the, as the base R call sums functions work. Um, so if you have a matrix like this, you can call the call sums function. It tells you for the first column that you sum up the entries, you get two, for the second column, you get one, and for the third column, you get one as well. But also, you can also calculate the same for the rows. You just have to adapt the function call, and it's all very straightforward and easy. The matrix package, now if we have a matrix like this, where there are plenty of zeros, has an efficient way to store sparse matrices, and it handles this with S4 classes. So what you have to do is you have to import the matrix, uppercase M matrix package, and then you can convert your dense matrix to a sparse matrix, for example, with the S function. And you get this S4 class where instead of storing each zero, you just store the elements which are non-zero. And that makes it a huge 
uh, much more efficient if you have many zeros in your data. The idea behind matrix stats, as Mike already mentioned, is pretty straightforward. You just, the idea is that you take the DGC matrix object and you call the call sums function, you get the same results as you get previously with the matrix package. So if you import both packages, the hope is that you don't need, even need to think about if you get an, if you have a dense matrix or a sparse matrix, you just call the same functions and you get exactly the same results. So the hope is, or the idea is that sparse matrix stats really functions as a drop-in replacement for matrix stats. So you can easily use both of them in your own package, depend on them, and it doesn't matter if you are uh, if you get for um, as an input a sparse or a dense matrix, you will just get the same results. I should mention, if you have any questions, any point, feel very free to interrupt me. Um, it's probably better to interrupt me right when I'm at some slide, which is more, uh, confusing than waiting for the end of the talk. Um, so the challenge, of course, is that you I don't have to do this for the most popular functions, but I want it to be complete and do this also for the more obscure function, like the row var diffs function, which first calculates the differences for each element and then, for example, calculates the variance on those. I'm not sure how many people actually ever have used this function, probably not so many, but it just feels better to be complete and not have like only half the functions implemented so you can actually rely on them. So for benchmarking, what I did is I, in this case, took some single cell data set. So in this case, the PBMC 4K data set, it's at, at uh, 4,000 columns and 20,000 rows. Um, I think it's roughly 500 megabytes in uh, memory in this dense matrix and it's 90%, 96% zeros. So there are lots of zeros in there, so we can store the data much more efficiently than drawing uh, each number individually. And the second advantage is we can also calculate much more efficiently on such a data set. So I ran as a first example, a benchmark where I compare the matrix stats core means, the sparse matrix stats core means, and the matrix, uppercase matrix, call means function. And as you can see, the sparse matrix stats package is a lot faster. So you actually get a 17x speed up. It's actually also even a bit faster than the uppercase matrix package, which, well, sounds nice in the beginning until you realize usually the guys at the core, uh, our core, really know what they're doing. So it might mean that I skipped some tests or, um, that maybe um, they have a different way to implement the sum, summing function. So this is well still encouraging that uh, it's in theory as fast as the R core implementation, but might also mean that at some point I might uh, uh, uncover some edge case which will require one more test, and then I will actually be only in uh, quotation marks as fast as the uppercase matrix. And if you compare this to the theoretical possibility of speed up, which is 25x, which would correspond to the much smaller number of data, of concrete numbers that you store in the data set. Some more comparisons. So the same also works for the call vars function, where you actually get an up to 40x speed up. It works for the call medians, which are often very simple to calculate for sparse matrices because most of them will be zero. So if more than half of the entries in a column are zero, then you immediately know the answer. And it also works for more complicated functions, for example, like call quantiles, which um, is a whole lot slower to calculate than for example, call medians, um, but it's still faster than working on the dense matrix. And the second important thing you might notice if you actually compare the memory allocation, so I had to write my own quantile, sparse quantile function, and that is much more memory efficient than the dense one working with a large matrix. So they actually have a 10,000 fold lower memory allocation than with the dense version. The can I, can I ask a well, question, Constantine? Sure. How how big in memory is the dense representation? Just naively, like when you've loaded it in. 
I think it's five hundred and B. I have a slide on this. Uh, oh no, I don't have. Haven't I? I think I might have later. Ah, later I have a slide on this where actually for this specific data. I think it's five hundred MB for the dense version, and I think it's seventy six megabytes for the sparse version. So to get to three point eight gigs, there's quite a lot of copying has gone on. In that case, even it's not like one uh, copy of it. Yes, it's, it's quite a few times. Okay. Yes, I guess you uh, would have to ask Henrik uh, how his exact um, quantile method is working. I did have a look at it and I didn't quite get it. I think it's doing quite a lot of stuff in parallel. So that's why it's actually probably quite fast. So you see that the speed up is less compared to the other methods. Um, but I guess there might be a trade off between using more memory and having a more efficient implementation for this Henry. specific use case. Yes. Hello, Henrik is here. Can you hear me? Oh, nice. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, awesome. Uh, I can comment. So, quantile, uh, the quantile colon row quantiles versions, they are calling R's quantile functions. It's not implemented in native code. It's iterating over rows and columns, but it's trying to avoid as much as uh, memory allocation as it possibly can. So it's. Uh, pardon? I thought for the type seven you had a dedicated implementation. Uh, oh, you might be right. I no, um, I don't think so. I'm looking at the code now. Um, <laughs> I mean, there there is a dedicated one, but it's still doing most of the things in R. There is no native. That's code true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, also I just want to make sure that you mentioned parallel processing. There is no parallel processing taking place at all in. In matrix stats, so it's a single. Oh, thread. that's mm -hmm. very yeah. important. So neither does for sparse matrix stats. So um, this is also something where I didn't dive into because it might get a lot more complicated. But yeah, this is of course very important. There is of course it's it might be possible to get further speed ups um, if one would also considering accessing columns in parallel. Um, but this is not something I've considered either. Yes, so what I was talking about is, so um, the same functions also work for the row-wise access. Um, they are a whole, a whole bit slower. So if you compare, for example, the call medians performance for spice matrix sets, which were the call medians take 14.6 milliseconds to calculate for this specific matrix, whereas the row-wise medians take more than 15 times longer, so nearly 200 milliseconds. This is because for many of the, most of the functions, I actually simply transpose the input before I call the row median. So I don't have a dedicated row implementation for most of the functions, except for a few, like for example, row vars, because I know this is one of the most important functions, for example, for single cell. So I actually sat down and try to make sure that I get the most efficient implementation possible, also for the row access. And there you see that you actually get a, also quite big difference between, um, so it's still slower. So between the, so call vars take 17 milliseconds and row vars takes roughly um, 36 milliseconds. So it's a bit slower, but it's not as much slower compared to the row medians functions. Um, because I think this is one of the most important ones. And this is also one of the open areas. So whenever somebody can convince me that they really, really need this row, whatever summary function to be a lot more efficient, this is probably something where one can still gain quite a lot of performance. Um, but right now, just simply for convenience, I most of the time transpose the input and then just call the column function. I think at this point it might be helpful to talk, to talk a bit about how actually the DGC matrix is internally implemented. So how does it store the data? So if you have a matrix like this and convert it to a DGC matrix and call the structure, we get an S4 object, which has most importantly, the I, the P and the X values stored in there as vectors. So they contain the information where the non-zero elements are in the matrix. So we can, so the P's are column pointers and the 
X and I are values and rho indices respectively. And the way that the DGC matrix is storing the data is that you have to look at the column pointers. There's always one element in the column pointer vector more than you have columns. So you have to look between like the first and the second element. And it tells you that you should look at the zero and first element of the X and Y vectors. And then you take the, let's say zeros element, you put the three, which is in the X vector at the ith. This is the row index of your matrix. And then you take the one and put it at the, in the third row of your matrix. And then you step through each of the columns. So for the second column, you have to take the second and third element. Then you put the sixth in the third row again, the seventh in the seventh row. Then you go to the fourth entry, put the five into the second row. You put the four and the one in the third row and so on. So this is a very efficient way to encode the sparse data, but it's not the most intuitive format. So you might be wondering why do something so complicated? Why not work with a triplet sparse matrix? So you simply store for each value, the row and the column index, and that's much easier to think about. So the same matrix could be encoded like this, where you simply store for all of those values, the column and row index. The reason why we don't do this is, so here is the answer to the question earlier, how big is actually this? PBMC 4K data set, so it's nearly 600 megabytes, um, that the DGC matrix is a more efficient, more condensed version of the data. So it needs more, less storage, and I think that's why it's the dominant object type that people use to store their sparse data, because they don't want to waste those um, additional 20% on simply having the same and uh, slightly more intuitive uh, internal storage. So awesome, now I want to talk, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't know about the DGT, GT matrix representation. And uh, I, I'm glad to see that they, they have something like that in matrix and uh, yes, exactly. I don't see it. Yeah, it's it's interesting, and uh, thanks for for talking about this. And I don't see a big difference in size, you know. Hmm. Um, and and really, the DGC representation, the column-oriented representation, introduces some uh, complexity to uh, to all the algorithm uh, all the algorithms that uh, we we want to implement natively on on the sparse objects. And, and Interesting. Okay. There, there is there is a also with a DGC representation there is a high cost to pay when you transpose. Mm -hmm. uh, That's true. Uh, whether with DGT transposition is is really straightforward. You just switch yes. the you know the column and and row in indices. And yes. uh, yeah, and you've run into this because as you said earlier. For some of your row functions, like row bars and others, mm -hmm. um, you didn't implement uh, those uh, functions natively. Just you know transpose the object and then call the the, the call function on on that, and you're paying a high price for the transposition, as you've noticed. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is yeah, actually just, right, so of course. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that mm -hmm. DGC is uh, very compact, but it, 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 it also has some drawbacks, some important ones. Yes, I'm not quite familiar how the transposition algorithm actually works for DGC matrix. Um, it is, of course, I show that it's not super efficient, and of course it would be trivial to transpose the GGT matrix. Um, so I guess there is or might be some point to be made that it could be worth considering what kind of gains one would have from using a DGT matrix. I think I never really considered this in the beginning. So this slide I really made yesterday in preparation for this talk, when I started with a package about a year ago, 
um, I knew that everybody in the single cell field was using the DGC matrices. So that was right. an obvious choice for me. Um, right, right. You're right. It's, and, it's the be... dominant representation. DGC is really the dominant uh, representation. It's, it's what everybody uses. Yes, exactly. Uh, I have a related question here. It's um, mm -hmm. so right. If someone comes and has a, a GGT matrix, mm -hmm. your will your functions automatically change it to DGC internally, or will it give an error? It should error. I okay. don't have implemented the S4 functions for DGT. One okay. could probably make those and automatically convert them. Um, but on the other hand, you might want to tell the user about this and then they can decide for themselves if it's okay for them to maybe always work the DGC matrix. Yeah, so that was my next question is like if you're looking at the bigger R community who might be interested in it, there might be people having in the DGT format mm -hmm. and it might, so can you in the future maybe see that you will implement that too? In theory, it shouldn't be, well, especially if I really just convert it to a GGC format, it shouldn't be difficult. Is is that an expensive transformation? And I mean, expensive both in time and memory. No, it shouldn't be because you really would only have to transform the column vector and you would basically do a run length encoding of that one more or less i guess so you, it's probably like like n1 like you have to make one new vector you have to iterate it through it once uh, through all the columns but it shouldn't be so it shouldn't be bad okay it should be quite okay. efficient but one could also think about so i want in a moment, in a moment i want to talk about how actually i implemented it and the code is like the c plus plus code is generic in the sense that it should also be possible to call it with different inputs that I could actually also handle this internally and then you might wouldn't even need the additional allocations. So that would also be, yes, a decision which could be made or should be made and then one could also maybe see additional gains for the row VARs because they would be very efficient then anyway. So you would completely avoid all the, yeah, conversion costs. Do do you know why the reason is the community using DGC? Is it just that the object is smaller and everyone went follow that? I follow the don't first know. Person? Um, that's a, a very good question. I'm not sure like who in the bio con, uh, bioinformatics community started with this. Maybe Aaron Lunn might know because he has been around long enough to actually I think have seen and shaped a lot of those developments. So maybe. He could be the person to ask for this, I'm not sure. Um, or maybe one of the other bioconductor people may, might remember when they first encountered the DGC matrix as a popular object in the bioconductor universe. It would be it would be really interesting to see if they had used T matrix, paying a little bit higher price for the input data being larger, but then actually the pipeline is more efficient and use less memory because you can implement the algorithm in a different way. It's mm -hmm. Just throwing it out there, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks. Aaron's on. Thinking... Sorry, yeah. I mean, if, if Aaron wants to speak, go for it, Aaron. Maybe not. Um, am I right in thinking that 10x genomics format that they distribute is, it's an HDF5 file, but with essentially the DGC format in there. I don't know if, again, they were the first or if they're just following again, but um, yeah, it's an, I guess it's another instance of where that format is used in the kind of raw data you get. Yeah, no, this is a very good point, Mark. I think maybe they actually could, could be one of the players in the field who, could, who would be able to shape the trajectory of what people actually use yeah. if they're not thinking about this. Cool, if there are no more questions, I will just continue. So I want to talk now a bit about how I actually implemented all those different functions. And I think what kept me sane there from like repeating the same boilerplate code 36 times over for each of the different functions was really embracing the 
way that you can now write quite functional and generic code in C++. So what I, so this is the actual implementation of the DGC matrix call means C++ function and internally it simply calls the SP mean, which is a sparse mean function um, for each of the columns in the data set. So the sparse mean function is doing exactly what you would imagine the sparse mean function to do. So it gets an iterator with the values and then it gets in addition how many zeros there are. So I completely ignore all the row information because I don't need this. I don't care in which order the data is coming in and then I iterate over the values. I increase some counter to see how many elements there are in total. And then I divide the sum by the size and then do some more checking to make sure that I return a NAN or an NA in the appropriate cases. So this function is quite straightforward. The more advanced and for me also quite, well, challenging part is because it was the first really bigger project I had to do in C++ and really diving into all the different templates and um, template level programming was, um, getting this reduced matrix to double or the reduced matrix double function correct because what it does is I give it the S4 matrix which has the information stored as I just told you. I also tell it if it should remove the NAs, so if they are automatically skipped. And then as a third parameter, I give it a C++ lambda. So this is what starts here with the square brackets and it gets as uh, values and the row indices and the number of zeros and returns a double. And internally, this lambda is simply calling the SP mean function. Um, and I think, so my package was one of the first which actually used quite heavily C++ 14 features. So this allowed me to write this really nice code where I don't even have to specify what kind of class values and row indices are because I have internally a way that if you want to remove the NAs, the iterator, which I have automatically skips those. So that was a bit challenging to express in C++. So I was struggling a lot there. In the end, I settled on those outro template parameter uh, from C++14, which make this re code really concise and easy to copy and reduces the boilerplate a lot. So I don't have to reduce the same kind of create the uh, result thing, fill it, make an iterator, uh, so write a follow up to iterate over all the columns, but I simply can call this reduce matrix double function, which is really generic. And then internally I can really work on the individual columns where I only have the number of zeros and the of the dense values to handle. So the rest of the implementation, so I think for the other 38 column functions really do look kind of similar. They have a very similar pattern. So there are some more complications for functions which might not return a vector, but which return a matrix, but the principle is very similar. The next really big challenge was making actually sure that I don't miss any edge case. So I think in total, when I now run my package, there are more than 4, 000, uh, 1,400 unit tests being run to really make sure that, well, it works. Um, so how I actually do this, I haven't hand coded all those 1,400 unit codes, but unit tests, but what I do is instead I have roughly 160 unit tests, and then I run them repeatedly over nine different input matrices. So where I have different edge cases for how the matrix could look. So I have one where there's all kinds of different values in there, one which has names, one which has zero rows, zero columns, with one which is completely empty, one where there are only zeros, one where there are very large or very small numbers to make sure that the numerical position is correct, and then also one with only plus and minus infinities. So this is how I try to make sure that I cover most of the edge cases and um, it often has been that if I added one new kind of edge case matrix type, that all of a sudden I found five new bugs because now then I realized, okay, this edge case I actually haven't really thought about. So this 
on the one hand, um, is a bit frustrating when you think, okay, now I've got it, and then you add something, you know, unit test, and then it fails. But on the other hand, you really want it to fail for you and not for the user um, who might not be familiar and then will be wondering why sparse matrix stats return something else than matrix stats. The good thing is because I have a very good template because I know I want to simply replicate exactly what matrix stats is doing. My unit tests all look very similar. So I call, I take a matrix, I convert it to a sparse matrix, and then I call sparse matrix stats with the sparse version, the matrix stats with the dense version, and then make sure that the results are exactly equal. During this process, Henrik might remember, I have actually filed a few bugs um, because you do encounter like the really weird edge cases and functions which probably nobody has ever used, but which are there. So, well, I wanted to replicate them. Um, and he has been really nice and helpful in addressing the things I had opened and um, fixing the bugs. So this was a really pleasant experience. Um, the Last thing I want to talk to you a bit about is how you can actually now incorporate the sparse matrix stats, the matrix stats, and also the delayed matrix stats package by Pete uh, Hickey, which is doing basically what my package is doing for sparse matrix for delayed matrices. And the solution for being able to handle all those different implementations for different matrices together is a, third a fourth package, the matrix generics package which this patches, so it provides the S4 generics so that if you call the cal vars function with a specific type of matrix, that in the end, the correct downstream package is called and that all the end users and other packages don't really need to worry about this. They can simply import and depend on the matrix generics package and then whatever they have in terms of matrix type will be dispatched to the correct kind of um, worker matrix stats package. Um, it was quite a bit of work to get this right. And I think, so I haven't put a lot of slides in this. Um, Javi is the best person to talk about this because he really made sure that all the edge cases um, work and that the dependency graph between the different packages makes sense because there also was some overlap. For example, there's a row ranges function in the summarized experiment package, which conflicts with the row ranges packet function from the matrix steps. So he really did most of the work getting this right and ready so that people can really depend on this and use this in production. And with this, I want to come to an end and thank in particular Hervé, Pete, uh, Henrik and Aaron, who helped me a lot, gave me advice, um, how to implement stuff, how to make sure that it actually is possible to call this from other packages, how to structure the matrix generics package. And I also want to uh, thank Laurie, uh, Laurie, Michael and Martin who helped with the package review and the whole bioconductor community um, for the infrastructure and the support. Uh, and also Mike for inviting me to give this talk today. Yes, thank you very much for your attention. So are there any questions for Constantine? I guess we asked quite a few during it, but uh, let's open the floor to anybody that has a, any more follow-up questions. Yeah, I have a related question. Um, it has a little bit to do with um, archaeology of all of this. Um, as I recall, the matrix package has a very large number of base types in there, not just the T and C that we discussed at length, but way more. And I think Part of the motivation for all this sparse business is, of course, coming from the dark ages when everybody had to operate on 16 kilobytes of RAM and all the rest of it. And you really had to go to sparse matrices to make things feasible. So then they're obviously interested in, in compacting. I, I sort of dimly recall discussions from way back when with, with or overhearing or just hearing them chat. Uh, Doug and Martin about matrix, its motivation for LME4, LME4's evolution going to Eigen via RCPP because so much sparse stuff was there. I always had a softer spot for Amadeo, which is easier to use um, than Eigen is now catching up on, on sparse, but it was really refreshing to see you just with the exuberance of youth, if I dare say that, 
wipe all of that aside and start all over and re-implement it yourself, which is good. Which brings me to the final point that Aaron L and I were shooting the breeze the other day on some requirements and others, and we decided not to rely on something that's upstream for me, that I've packaged, that he uses, which would have imposed C++14. Are we all good to go in Bioconductor with C++14 as you use it so heavily, or are we not? It was, I think, our understanding that 11 is better because there may always be a CentOS machine from 1973 that doesn't yet have a compiler and, you know, sort of all the usual things. So it's actually the current CentOS 7 doesn't have it. Yep. I know. I just, I just ran into that yesterday with the updated RSVP Amadio. Terrible. But, you know, our users are maybe on clusters with conservative infrastructure. So this is, this is a challenging trade-off. So where does Bioconductor now stand on that with 14 versus 11 versus whatever? Maybe I can quickly comment from my side. So I did have, like, it's rough, right before the point where I submitted the package, I actually did revert all the C14 features to make sure, because at that point it was right before the uh, 4.0 <laughs> release of R, and it wasn't quite clear if actually the C14 support would be universally there. Um, it did make the code a whole lot uglier, so that's really why I used those features. Um, if there were an easy way to do it with C11, which is as nice, I would be happy to not use it. Um, so for me, in the end, was a trade-off between my convenience and, of course, some people who are old infrastructure who might not be able then to use my package. Um, I did, my understanding is that now with uh, R4.0, C++14 support is on all different operating systems, including Windows, which was the one which I think made the most problems, if I remember correctly, but which was then, yes, supported. And for me, because Bioconductor is also always with the latest R version, I felt, okay, I also do want to take advantage of the latest features. Yeah, I remember. I remember when you submitted the package, we didn't have a support for C14 yet on Windows because that was before our tools for zero. But, but you got really lucky because a couple of weeks after that, our tools for zero uh, came up and, and we were able to install it on our Windows builders and then your package finally passed. Uh, build and check on Windows. Uh, that was, just, you know, a couple of weeks before the release. So yeah, perfect timing. So from a personal perspective, I tried to install it when I asked you to give the talk um, on our on Seneca, which is a big shared memory machine, um, and it fails because the default compiler on there is. Four point the GCC four point eight or something like that, um, and so then it, uh, yeah exactly. Um, and so you, you it is possible to do it through the easy build system and like the, the some of the things have been set up so it works under some scenarios but not universally. And the kind of if you on that particular computer if you run rdevel you can't install it. At least I haven't managed to. I'm not saying you can't do it, but um, after. A, an hour of trying to make make vars files and change default compilers, which then conflicted with other things that had been built for the machine and things. So I guess this comes back to the, the conservative HPC infrastructure point, really. Um, and yeah, I ran into that yesterday. Um, so actually, one of my questions is C plus plus fourteen question mark. So I'm glad that Dirk raised it instead. Yeah. Yeah. So again, sort of historically speaking, I'm personally a hundred percent on board with what Constantine did for me as a developer in my little corner. You know, if it's in writing our extensions and I was just getting into the info file as you were speaking, and of course it's sort of there, and yes, that was the barrier that happened with R4 and the better tool flow. So that, but it's sort of, it's a bit like, uh, you know, if you want to talk fancy, it's like sufficient and necessary. I mean, it makes it feasible to build it on some systems, but I think as developers, we have a responsibility to ensure that it works on most systems. And with that, we still have to be a bit more conservative where we can. It's it's a it's a really nasty trade-off because this is this looks like a 
wonderful infrastructure package and all the reasoning is of course perfectly sane that the code is more concise and better and what have you but but it, it's it's tricky it will it will exclude some users there will be others just like mike who just downloaded hit build and are then just hitting a brick wall because um because of the new compiler requirement so does anybody have a good feeling how many how big is the percentage of people who might be still stuck not being able to use c plus plus 14 because i have no experience in this field you know we had this problem earlier in the early years of rcpp and i had the opportunity to then learn a bit from jj who contributed a lot back then when with attributes and the other stuff and he knew full well from the experience of our studio which commercial customers back then i mean years ago much smaller field still had really really hold red hat instances and you know the sad truth simply is there will be bazillions and you know that matters for them with commercial customers but at the end of the day this is bioconductor you don't care about an insurance company in south dakota but on the other hand you care about hpc users and clusters and it will be half a decade till CentOS 7 is gone there. So actually, I, I might correct myself. I'm looking at my CentOS 7. It looks like it has support for 14 by default. So I was wrong before. It's 17, yeah, but it, it doesn't it's, have. It's partial ones. I mean, I looked at that yesterday because I got a compiler error I'd never seen before. Package build everywhere on CRAN, all the reverse depends checks, and then I got a CentOS 7 user. I mean, it was sort of, <clears throat> Really silly code. I had a const running around that wasn't used, so you would have gotten a, a warning about an unused variable, but because it was a const, it didn't. And then the compiler puked because I made it a const, and in newer Amadio code, it was now a const expression because Amadio has passed this boundary just now this week and made 11 the minimum requirement. And that CentOS machine then with 4 8, and that's what went, went belly up over what is essentially a compiler error. So I think we're both correct that. 4.8 had tried to implement parts of it. It's, it's still incomplete. And parts of 14, so you you will get by with, with some things, but it may hit with others. So it's yeah, it remains hairy. But okay, so it's not. I think we shouldn't problem. belabor this point. Um, <clears throat> certainly, if we have a really good app, this is what's going to push IT folks to improve their systems. And um, containers are another way to get things going. Um, now. I have a couple of questions that might be off track, uh, but one of them is if, suppose I have a statistic that you don't know about. Do you have an apply concept uh, in the sparse world? Is that doable? In theory, so internally, yes. So I have it in R and in C++. For some function, it was just easier to have it all in R. Um, because I really stuck closely to what the matrix sets packages were writing. It's not there because I guess people would just use the apply function there. Um, although I guess it could be convenient also for others, um, but I haven't thought about how one could make it more generic because, yeah. And if it actually would be the right place to have those in sparse matrix stats right. as well. Um, Agreed, it might be out of scope. The other question is whether you do any benchmarking against Python. No, not at all. Thanks. I, well, yes, I could, it would be interesting to see, uh, I'm not sure, what is the typical or the best sparse uh, summary function packages in Python? I don't even have any experience. I, I don't either, but it seems like it's a, a selling point of Python. <clears throat> That it, it, you know, it does these things sort of at a high level. Uh, I don't know about sparse, but certainly in numericals, uh, math, you know, to to get a transpose and just change the stride, um, seems to be something that 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 community is is energized about. And so it'd be nice to know whether uh, you know there are Python packages that are um, competitors and whether you can perform as well. So if somebody knows, I would be very curious because well especially for the really mainly used function, which is, I guess, Carl Sun, Carl Means, Rovers, I want to be as fast as possible. Um, so if somebody can point me somewhere, and also what is the best way to make this comparable, like those benchmarks comparable between Python and R, that would be very interesting.
another question. Um, what is your uh, philosophy with um, column names and row names? So one thing that I really uh, like about base R is if you do something like a row sums, you also get like the, the, the names. And this is something that I'm really missing in metric stats because um, it's, it's, it's just more secure at some point to basically also get the names. So is there an idea to also support this or what are your thoughts? I'll hand off to Henrik because I just do whatever he does. Yeah, so that that uh, has been procrastinated. Uh, so you might actually get names in some, but uh, that's in a long-term roadmap. And it, when it's implemented, it would be like an option, again, for maximizing performance. So you should be able not to have to deal with names. Um, but uh, there's nothing preventing it, but it, it's, uh, it's not uh, on the top of the list. It's not the first one asked, but isn't another one related? Some that shows up in some functions, like asking for support for drop false and drop true. Um, it happens in a small subset. It's one of these things, yeah. It's, uh, but again, it's like testing and things needs to be in place. <laughs> so I hear you. I don't forget you. <laughs> I have a question um, about the, and that's coming from my, from the matrix stats, pure matrices. Um, if you're using matrix generics to call matrix stats, has anyone looked at the overhead on that? Uh, because I can imagine there's a big overhead from the S4 generics. I have not punched Barclay myself, but I guess the bioconductor people, maybe every can answer this one um, because they use the expert, I guess, on this. So the reason why I'm is like, should the advice be for people who import matrix generics to maybe actually do the colon colon operator to avoid that overhead? Maybe that should be like a best practice. Wouldn't it be surprising if the overhead uh, added, you know, maybe it adds 10% to evaluation time? And isn't the convenience worth it? Um, or I mean, maybe I should just change that into a statement and we don't need to discuss it. <laughs> My opinion is. And, that the overhead it, uh, doesn't it doesn't compromise the convenience. Uh, I think the history of matrix stats when I started to expand on it was like I iterated of, over hundreds of thousands of small matrices. Right. So uh, yeah, I didn't run one big thing. I ran many, many, many small ones. So but, yeah. I mean, I'm, I can imagine that's a question that will show up in the future, so it would be useful to know or have some sense. Yeah. I also want to say thanks for the testing. I think it's brilliant that delayed matrix stats and sparse matrix stats comes in. It's like sending a spaceship to, there are like now three different teams trying to like cover the test cases and there are always corner cases we're missing, but it's very, very helpful. And my dream would be that we come up together with one test framework one day and test everything. Another question, um, what about sparse model matrices? So I think there is a package which can somehow implement this. And I mean, maybe at some point this would be really cool that you have something also like a support for a sparse model matrix and then do a really efficient QR decomposition and so on and um, can solve these things. I don't know if you have thought about this, um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. There is, of course, also a lot of demand for sparse matrices outside the summary functions, but for many of the standard linear algebra like QR decomposition or I guess matrix multiplications are implemented by the matrix package. Um, it's not something I have thought about. Um, I think there are a handful of or one or two packages who try to implement specific algorithms or set of algorithms for sparse matrices, but because this hasn't really been an issue for me, I can't really 
even tell you what they were called, but I could look it up um, if you want to credit. I think Zorat is even using a dense version for a sparse model matrix. So it's like, I, I think there could be really some improvement. I think at one point I just looked at the code and if I remember correctly, yeah, there, there could be some improvements. But if you say model matrix, you mean linear model, that then the yes. whole linear yes, model yes, should right. be fit with sparse. Right. I guess there should be some sparse linear model. I'm pretty sure I saw something like that, but maybe I'm also wrong about this. So I can tell actually, because this is another package I did work on, that for generalized linear models, sparsity is not so useful, it turns out, because what you have there is that you have, in addition to the input matrix, so, so what I did, I had another package called GLM Gampois, which fits a GLM model uh, for the Gamma Poisson distribution. And what you have in the GLM cases, you have a dense, mean matrix. So even if you have a sparse input matrix with lots of zero counts, you will always still have the dense mean matrix. So even if you were to use a sparse matrix for the input, you would still have to carry around the full dense matrix. So what I actually then fall back to is if the stuff gets too big, my package falls back to the delayed matrix things, um, which is not more, which, which isn't faster, but which it, Bit there, but which is um, more memory friendly. I have a really large data set. Well, I'm just going to jump in now and uh, thank Constantine again. That was really <laughs> awesome. Uh, it's been a really cool presentation and really great um, discussion about things as well. Um, it's been good to see everybody so active on this. Um, I just want to approach one other topic, um, which has been, I guess, discussed quite heavily in the um, uh, in our Slack channel and things, which is this, uh, this renaming of the master branch or main branch in, in Git, basically, which I think has happened now on GitHub. Um, and I guess I just wanted to ask Martin whether there was kind of a, a strategy for what the Bioconductor Git server is going to do going forward. Is it going to also change the, that branch name, or are we going to just sort of when we do the first import, go back to calling it master and things. I guess, uh, just have you guys thought about it and, and is there a strategy going forward? Yeah, I wanted to say, first of all, that um, we've already encountered packages that have been created since, uh, that have been, that are being contributed to Bioconductor and that have been created since the change from master to main. So actually the first step in our, uh, uh, in our review process was broken because it was looking for a branch called master. And uh, our current uh, sort of resolution of that has been to map whatever their default branch is in the contributed package to our master branch. Um, so there's already like this cognitive dissociation between what the, what the user, the branch the user thinks about on their Git repository, GitHub repository, versus the branch that we use in our, um, in our internal uh, repository. And then I also wanted to say that the, the branch that we use internally, um, like having a single branch that you are confident of as being the definitive source is actually crucial for, for instance, the build system. It starts on a, on a nightly basis. It starts by checking out the master branch and, um, and so there is tremendous value in um, being um, consistent within our infrastructure on what the branch is called. And then maybe the other thing is that, of course, all of our, you know, developers, you guys out here on the, on the call, um, push and pull to the git.bioconductor.org repository. And so all of your own workflows um, have uh, um, a particular branch that you're expecting to push to. Uh, nonetheless, I think actually it's a great opportunity to think about what we call that branch. And um, for instance, it's always very confusing when you say, hey, if you're, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to push to the Devel branch of Bioconductor, but that's actually the master branch of the Git uh, repository. And so um, my sort of radical thought is, uh, to actually just rename, uh, internally rename our branch Devel. And uh, 
and, and then there's a semantic consistency within the project, there's already uh, this cognitive dissidence uh, from GitHub to our Git as, as it stands. So why not exploit that to our advantage and, and call it uh, the develop branch? Um, and I guess also I'll just say, uh, you know, as speaking on behalf of the project leadership, I'm actually uh, fully supportive of removing uh, the mass, the, the use of the term master um, in this context. And um, I hope that we can arrive at uh, some technical solution that um, uh, works uh, with minimal uh, disruption uh, across um, the, the project and going forward as well. Um, so those are my thoughts. I, Martin, I have to say I'd really appreciate like it being called Devel as well. That would be great. Um, and and um, as part of community advisory and code of conduct, we've had a couple of ish, couple of comments about ma master slave as well. I guess also we've been we're you know just a week or so away from the the release, so this is on the radar for the next release cycle. So over the next several months, we'll come up with a whatever our strategy is going to be and and whatever the implementation is. So at the moment, as developers, we don't need to do anything different. Not yet. You've already got a strategy for the new packages coming in, and the rest of us um, maintain the current status quo on the git.wire conductor server um, until told otherwise, essentially. Yeah. I mean, actually, if you do submit a new package and uh, you sort of blindly go with what GitHub gives you when you create a new repository, then you will be faced with uh, the, the GitHub repo having a branch called main and the bioconductor repository having a branch called master and somehow figuring out whatever the Git magic is to push to the right uh, right branch in the right uh, upstream repository. So, thanks for bringing that up, Mike. I hope that provides a little bit of clarity on where we're going. Uh, promise. Yeah. Uh, so when you, if you can switch to develop, can you also then have a release? Or when you're patching old versions? Uh, so the releases have a, the current structure is, the re each release has its own branch and it's called in shouting, uh, uh, shouting mode, uh, so all caps, cap, release yeah. underscore three underscore 12 or whatever. But can you have, uh, does it work with Git to have an alias? So release is always the late, latest release? Well, that's actually an interesting question, and I don't know about the the way that Git works. Whether you can have some concept of an alias. Uh, superficially, I haven't seen that, but I haven't really investigated. If there's a Git Pro on the on the call, or that'd be interesting to know. And another wish I would have is like, since I'm working, I have my posting on GitHub, and then I connect things to my conductor. It would be useful to have like a prefix to say bio C develop. It's clear to me that I this see. is, yeah, but that's right. just my personal flavor. No, that's very useful to think about. Great, well, thank you for the update, Martin. Um, and we're at the hour now, so I'll bring this session to the close. Thanks again to Constantin. Um, that was a really fantastic talk at short notice, so thank you for stepping in with that. Um, it also, if you haven't seen in the chat, it looks like the support.bioconductor website is back up and running. Um, there's already a lot of unanswered questions, so that's what we should go and do in the next hour, right? Um, I mean, not for me here in Europe, it's the end of the day, but for you guys in the States, you, you can spend your day working on that. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'll check it in the morning. But with that, thanks very much. Um, and next month we have um, Gabe Becker is, has agreed to give a talk on Altrep um, and what, what that means to us. It was by far and away the most uh, requested topic in our little poll of, of things um, that we might want to discuss. So um, hopefully I'll, I'll check in a couple of weeks. He's still good to do it, but he's, he's agreed that he would come and give us a presentation on that. So 
Um, hopefully that will be uh, next week, next month's, um, I think it's the 19th of November, but I'll post the details a bit closer to the time. And thanks very much.